Thank you, Rosario, uh, for the introduction and for the invitation today. Uh, so I'd like to tell you about uh, vector commitments and functional commitments from lattices. And this is work with my students, uh, Zachary Cuppin and Chad Sharp at uh, Michigan. So <clears throat> the topic of the day, of course, is vector commitments. So it's a very brief reminder. The idea behind a vector commitment is that you should be able to take some large uh, amount of data here represented as a vector of uh, D entries, M1 through MD, and then put it through a commitment procedure uh, to get some much smaller commitment C. And the idea behind uh, the, the functionality behind vector commitments is that after you've committed to this, uh, this large amount of data uh, as a small commitment, you can then open individual entries of it. So when you want to open the ith uh, entry of the vector, <clears throat> you put it through this uh, open procedure and it will produce a, produce a proof P sub I. Uh, and that proof P sub I is intended as the proof for the ith entry uh, of the data. That is the ith entry of the data is what you said it is. And then you can provide this proof along with the uh, original commitment to a verifier. And so by providing uh, the co original commitment, the proof and the claimed uh, entry M sub I to the verifier, the verifier will either accept uh, and say, yeah, this all looks good. I believe that the ith entry is M sub I or, or you know, declare that, no, I'm not convinced uh, of that fact. And the main uh, security property that we ask for is position binding, which says that it should be infeasible for an attacker to create some commitment uh, and then open it in two different ways at the same position. So it should be infeasible to come up with uh, you know, two different messages, MI and MI prime, that, uh, and, and also valid proofs uh, for both of those messages at the same index I for the same commitment C. <clears throat> so that's the, the basic functionality of vector commitments. And note that this doesn't, uh, I haven't articulated any uh, hiding property. So we don't explicitly ask that this C uh, hide any information about the message, although that can easily be added uh, kind of after the fact. So we'll mostly be looking at this uh, binding property today. Another uh, uh, functionality or efficiency feature that you might look for uh, is something called updatability or even stateless updates. And the idea here is that you'd like to be able, uh, if the message data changes, to update the commitment uh, and even the proofs uh, without having to kind of rerun the entire procedure, the commitment procedure and the proof procedures over from scratch, but rather just do some small uh, updates to the existing commitment and the existing proofs that you already have in your, in your hands. So the syntax would look something like this. If we have uh, an original commitment and then we get uh, some position J changes and it changes by some amount delta. So it increases maybe or it decreases. And you can feed these, these three values into the update commitment procedure and get uh, the updated C prime here. And so C prime would then act as a commitment to this modified uh, message vector where just the jth entry has been updated uh, by adding delta to it. And then similarly for proofs, we can say that if uh, entry j changes by adding delta to it, then um, and we have a valid proof of position i in the past, then we can update that proof to some pi prime, which will still verify. It will still uh, show that position i uh, is what you say it is, uh, but now relative to this new updated uh, commitment C prime. Okay, so these stateless updates are a nice feature to have. Uh, it means that you don't necessarily, the clients don't necessarily have to keep the entire data around, but can rather update their uh, concise, you know, local commitments and proofs uh, instead. Finally, uh, the, the last concept I'll introduce is something that probably haven't seen as much today, but maybe a little bit is this idea of functional commitments. And the setup here is very much the same as what we've had before, except that instead of opening an entry I, you can do something much more uh, flexible, much more powerful, which is that you can open some arbitrary function uh, of the, the message data as a whole. So instead of just opening a single entry of the message, you can apply some function to the entire data. Let's call that function F. <clears throat> and after opening uh, the value of F, you get some proof p sub i as before, or maybe we should call it p sub f. And then the verifier is uh, given the original commitment 
this proof and a claim that uh, the value of f of m equals y. And the verifier decides, you know, am I convinced by that or, or not? Okay, so the vector commitment is a special case of this where the functions f are merely the selection selector functions, right? They select the ith entry from the entire vector. You can imagine much more uh, rich classes of functions such as uh, inner products on the vector or Boolean, you know, arbitrary Boolean functions uh, on the vector, <clears throat> for example. Okay, so those are the three uh, concepts that we'll be looking at today, the vector commitments, uh, stateless updatability and, and functional commitments. So, uh, oh yeah, I should mention the security property here is very similar uh, to before, it's just the natural thing. It should be infeasible to open uh, the same commitment for a function f uh, in two different ways or to have two different values, right? So you can't, you can't convince the verifier that f of m equals y and it also equals uh, f of m also equals y prime for some different uh, y prime. Okay, so some uh, selected highlights of, of prior work on vector commitments. Uh, of course, you know, Merkle trees are implicitly the very first uh, examples of vector commitments. They allow you to do uh, proofs in size uh, logarithmic in the dimension of the vector, right? So D all throughout the talk will be the dimension or number of entries in the, the data vector. <clears throat> but one big drawback of Merkle trees is that they're not, they don't have this uh, stateless updatability uh, as far as we can, uh, can see. Uh, so you have to actually have the original data in order to update the uh, commitment uh, when something in the data changes. You have to use all the original data to do so. Um, now there are examples of statelessly updatable vector commitments. Uh, and in fact, they even have smaller proofs asymptotically. The proof size does not grow with the dimension D. And these are based on more algebraic assumptions like RSA and pairings. And, uh, but both of these problems, or uh, both of these assumptions are sort of quantum breakable, right? In a quantum world, we would be able to break uh, all of these uh, example, you know, problems, RSA and pairings. Um, now, there is one, uh, as far as we know, just one prior example of a uh, vector commitment that is post-quantum apart from the Merkle trees. And it's kind of Merkle-ish, it's, it's inspired by Merkle trees, but it actually gets stateless uh, updatability, and it's based on this post-quantum uh, SIS assumption, which I'll, I'll state in a, a couple of slides. And this is work by Papamanthu uh, et al. In, in, in 2013. So it, it works kind of like Merkle trees, but it, it manages to still have the stateless updatability property and uh, also post-quantum uh, security. <clears throat> There's many applications of these uh, kinds of uh, verify, uh, uh, sorry, vector commitments from outsourcing of storage to uh, zero knowledge sets, accumulators, credentials, and cryptocurrencies, of course. So lots of uh, nice applications of these things. And we'd like to have more constructions and a, a wider variety of uh, efficiency and, and functionality uh, choices. Uh, then moving to functional commitments, um, there is also a good deal of work uh, in this, but it um, it's limited in the, in the following way. So the initial work on functional commitments managed to give uh, functional commitments for linear functions. So basically inner products of uh, the data <clears throat> with some vector that you, that you desire. Uh, and that was using pairing uh, type assumptions. And there was a recent work um, from, I guess a year and a half ago or so, uh, extending to what they called sparse polynomials. Um, but actually these sparse polynomials are still what we do call linearizable. We consider them to be linearizable, meaning uh, you take your message data and if you pre-process it uh, in, in advance and then commit to some kind of expanded version of the data, then the functions you can apply to that pre-processed data are still limited to linear functions, right? So uh, you can kind of get low degree polynomials by sort of taking um, combinations of monomials of the of the original data. So this is still kind of linearizable uh, inherently. Um, and, and so we're limited to linear uh, functions in a, in a fundamental way. Now, if we want to go beyond uh, linearizable functions, there's only one prior construction. Um, as far as we know, it's using uh, SNARKs. So it's a pretty heavyweight tool, SNARKs for NP. And most importantly, SNARKs cannot be constructed 
uh, with a black box security proof based on falsifiable assumptions. This is a result of uh, Gentry and Wicks from about a decade ago. So in order to go beyond uh, linearizability in your functional commitments, uh, you, you know, at this point, you need to use a much heavier hammer uh, and, and much uh, kind of more, let's say, non-standard uh, type assumptions. Uh, but we'd really like to have these. There are many applications of functional commitments, uh, such as these listed here and probably others uh, that we're not aware of or that we can't yet imagine. Okay, so that's what uh, that's kind of what the state of the art was at the at the time of our work. And uh, let me now tell you about our, our contributions in this work, which was in uh, it was in TCC last fall. So we give a, a new uh, post quantum um, uh, vector commitment. It's uh, also based on the SIS assumption, um, and it is statelessly updatable, just like uh, the prior work. But it has significantly shorter proofs uh, than the the prior work of Papamantu et al. Uh, in particular, we get on the order of uh, linear factor improvement in the uh, length of the proof. So linear in the dimension of the uh, of the vector. So our proofs are going to be a polylogarithmic length in the the length of the data rather than uh, super linear uh, as in the prior work. And then we're also uh, a significant uh, secondary result, second result here is that we give uh, functional commitments that are also based on SIS for arbitrary uh, Boolean circuits of uh, some priori, a priori bounded size. So we can say like n to the 10th uh, sized Boolean circuits, and we can give you a, a functional commitment scheme that supports uh, uh, all such uh, Boolean circuits. And uh, a few remarks about this result. This is really, uh, as I was mentioning before, this is the first result that goes beyond linearizable functions uh, while still be, being based on a falsifiable assumption, uh, namely the, the standard uh, short integer solution lattice problem. So it's, it's based on a well-studied uh, and, and in particular falsifiable assumption and uh, is the first thing to, to get beyond linear functions for uh, functional commitments. Um, secondly, it's the first post-quantum uh, functional commitment at all. Uh, beyond vector commitments, of course, um, and, and from a falsifiable assumption. So um, we did not have any post-quantum, uh, even linear functional commitments uh, prior to this work. And uh, in, this, in our work, we actually focus on the special case of linear, um, linear functions and, and give a particularly uh, more efficient um, instantiation of them com as compared to the arbitrary Boolean circuits. Um, one caveat or, or thing to note about this result is that it's working in a, a new model that we introduce in which uh, there's an online authority. So there's an authority that you go to to ask, uh, you say, I want uh, to you know, prove something about function f. I want to prove function f on my, my data. You have to go to the authority and say, hello, authority, please give me what we call an opening key uh, for this function f. And then the authority will uh, publicly, you know, publish uh, a what's what's called the opening key for that, and you use that opening key to prove uh, that indeed f of m equals what you say it is. Um, and that key, that opening key, is reusable, so it's not tied to you. Uh, it can be used by anybody else who wants to prove, you know, the value of f on their own data, um, and it it you know it can be made public and. Um, is not tied to any particular person, but you do need the authority to generate this uh, this opening key uh, at some point before you are able to prove anything about f of, of uh, your data. So I think this is a, an interesting new model, um, and you know it would be great to consider whether that can be relaxed or, or removed in some way. Uh, but this is what we require so far. And then there are a couple of uh, secondary contributions which I won't really talk about uh, today. Um, first, we're going to we give a uh, formal definition and a, a generic construction of uh, what we call zero knowledge uh, vector commitment. In particular, this implies hiding of uh, the data that you commit to. But um, also, when you introduce things like updates, updating proofs, updating commitments, um, there are, you know there may be those update values may somehow introduce uh, leakage about the data, and so we we consider all of all of the information uh, and, and give uh, a construction and analysis 
of uh, zero knowledge, something that's zero knowledge, you know, kind of in it, in totality. <clears throat> and then we also give a formal analysis of uh, what seems to be a folklore uh, transformation on vector commitments uh, that uses, it's kind of like a Merkle tree, but you use a larger arity. You don't use a binary tree. You can use a larger uh, branching factor in the tree. And it's been known as Verkle trees in, in the, in the uh, literature. Um, and we give a formal analysis of, of this. Uh, it's a, a pretty natural idea, uh, but it, it, I don't think it had been um, carefully analyzed before, especially with respect to updates uh, and so forth. So those are the main contributions, but we'll focus today on uh, point one. And if there's time, I'll give highlights of, uh, of point two uh, as well. And maybe a couple remarks about uh, this uh, secondary number two here. Uh, are there any questions at this point before we kind of go into a little more technical detail? I had a question about the distinction between uh, between this improved lattice construction uh, relative to PSTY 13. Will you will you clarify later that the caveats like the trusted setup, the public parameter sizes? Yeah, we have a table of a lot of uh, oh, okay. a lot of different things. Yeah. Cool. Go. Thank you. In fact, it's here. Okay, so let's go to that one. Um, so. So just to compare in more detail, the um, so there, there are two tables on this uh, slide. One is uh, just looking at sort of, it's not a formal definition, but things that kind of don't use a tree structure, <clears throat> but are more like just base uh, vector commitments and that are uh, statelessly updatable. So the first three rows of here are, uh, you know, prior works and not all of them, but the, the sort of, um, the most notable for comparison purposes. Um, so based on RSA and then uh, uh, CDH on, with pairing friendly groups and then Q type assumptions. And so here we're looking at the size of the public parameters, the size of the commitment, the size of a proof, what type of setup it has and whether it's post quantum. And uh, so you can see here that we have uh, Parameters which are on the larger size, side, on the larger side, uh, they are d squared, where d again is the dimension of the data that you're committing to. Um, so some of the prior works had had also d squared, but others are d order d. Um, our 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 commitment size is uh, logarithmic in d as opposed to constant, uh, and likewise for the proof size. <clears throat> And the reason for the log D is not really the same as why it's log D in Merkle trees, for example. It has more to do with the accumulation of uh, small, small entries, um, but we'll, we'll talk about that uh, later. Um, we have private setup, just like uh, all the prior works here, but we are post-quantum, um, whereas all these can be broken by quantum computers. Uh, uh, and so, if, Chris? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. If you were to put uh, PSTY 13 in this table, the, mm -hmm. the public parameters would be uh, of size D and the proof size would be log D or log squared D. Ah, I see you have it there. Yeah, here's the here's the comparison to PSTY. So PSTY uh, also give a post-quantum statelessly updatable uh, vector commitment. And here we're comparing, um, PSTY is kind of a tree type uh, construction. And so if we plug our tree we also give a uh, kind of a specialized tree type construction based on SIS. Um, and so if you kind of compare apples to apples between the two, uh, here's what you get. So um, here the tree height is H and the arity or the, the branching factor of the tree is uh, D. Okay, so if you use the same tree structure between the two uh, works, PSTY and ours, these are the asymptotics that you get. So PSTY, the public parameters would be H squared D or H squared D squared. So we, we kind of are worse by a factor of D in the size of the public parameters. Um, the commitment sizes are the same asymptotically, but the proof sizes uh, are much better in our case. We, we lose a factor of D um, compared to, to the prior work. So this seems like a win in that you, you have a factor of D larger public parameters. Those are fixed and set for all time, but then every proof that you produce is a, a D factor uh, smaller. So um, it seems like a worthwhile trade-off. Um, this does come at the expense of our, our setup being uh, private. So this is a private key setup, meaning that uh, you need an authority to generate 
some secrets <clears throat> and then produce the public parameters and then go away, right? Or destroy their, their, their secrets that they know. Whereas the PSUI has a public setup, meaning this kind of public coin, you just need a bunch of random uh, public coins and that's what uh, the public parameters consist of. And, and both of these are based on a post quantum assumption, of course. And here, uh, the D in the second table is the tree arity, whereas the D in the first table is the size of the deck. Okay. Yeah, right. So this is a non tree. These top uh, table is like non tree uh, based constructions. So they're just sort of atomic or, or you know, on their own um, without any extra tree structure. So that there, the, that's the sort of total degree, so, sorry, total dimension of your data. And then here, down here, the total dimension of your data is d to the h, because you're working with a, a height h tree with branching factor d. So um, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can balance these things. If you have very high dimensional data, you might use a tree with um, you know moderately high height, uh, so that you can bring little d down. Um, but uh, if you have moderately sized data, maybe you just directly use this or you use something with height two or three, something like that uh, down here. <clears throat> um, the, the kind of rule of thumb that you would use is, I that I would say would be to use the uh, largest D you can subject to the parameters, you know, still fitting within your, your restrictions uh, because larger D is, is sort of better uh, throughout here, right? You can see this is poly and this is h cubed, but it's log squared d. So if you push push everything to a larger d, you're actually improving, uh, but you're you're lowering h and actually improving the sizes uh, of the commitment and the proof here. So so this uh, second tree construction from the second table is the Verkle like construction, right? Yeah. No, um, no. So the Verkle the Verkle construction is a generic one. It, right, does right. Not, it does not give you stateless updates. So you lose, right. uh, you lose stateless updates. What we have in the paper, and, and it's sort of qualitatively similar to PSTY, is a specialized uh, tree type construction, which still preserves uh, stateless updatability. But uh, in, in either way, <laughs> like this construction, the proof size doesn't depend on the arity, which is basically vertical like this last construction in this table, second table. Uh, here, uh, log, log yeah. squared uh, h cubed log squared d. Yeah, yeah so I, I guess it, it's only log logarithmic, yeah. which is right, nice. Right. But yeah, it's not, yeah, so you still have the vertical like construction on top of this, which is- really Correct, nice. yeah. So so you can, I think if you do the vertical construction, um, it's no longer h cubed, it's like h and then log d. Um, but you lose, up, you lose stateless updates. So, we're, we're paying uh, for stateless updates by a uh, kind of a larger exponents on the H and on the log D in, in this construction. If you do the vertical things, you will get something like H log D as your proof size, uh, but without, without stateless updates. Yeah, good, good questions. Um, uh, anything, yeah. Yeah, so there's a question in the chat and then I have a question. So the question in the chat says, <coughs> It, that authority that you had for the functional commitment be shared among many parties like a trusted setup using MTC? Yeah, great question. So can the authority be shared among many parties? Yes, uh, in the sense that, um, you know, if I have data and you have data and he has data and she has data, we can all use the same uh, opening keys that the authority produces. So. I may be the first one to go to the authority and say, hello, I would like to uh, open my data under function F. And then the authority will just say, okay, I'll create an opening key for F and I'll, I'll just publish it. I could put it on the blockchain or something. And then anybody uh, now or in the future who wants to also prove F on their data, their own data can use that same opening key and they don't have to go back to the authority. But then if uh, you, for example, want to prove function G on your data, you'll need to go to the authority and say, okay, please give me the opening key for function G. That will be made public. And then the whole world can use uh, the opening key for function G. So it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit of a kind of a hybrid between like, you know, identity-based encryption where you have 
uh, you have to go to authority and authority, but the key that it gives you is specific to you and has to be kept secret. Here, the opening keys uh, are public and can be used by anybody. Right. And the follow-up question was um, if this process could be implemented like an MPC. Oh, I see. Uh, sure. Yes. I mean, any right. any trusted authority could be could be distributed, you know, as a as an MPC. Right. So I have a question. So, and I, I my internet went off for a minute. So you might have addressed it while I was offline. Okay. Uh, is so any functional commitment would give you a snark, right? Um, it's a good question. Yeah, I I I, I wonder about it. I haven't given an example earlier, right? Um, yeah. So my intuition says yes. I have not like written it down and formalized it enough to fully convince myself of this, but yeah, you, there there may be something to this. So. Is this a, is is the model of the authority is what would allow you to bypass the Gentry Weeks uh, result? Yeah, that my intuition is that there's something to that, uh, but I, I haven't been able to write it down carefully. But as you say, if indeed a functional commitment really gives you a snark, then this uh, you know relaxed authority model that we give might no. be. Yeah, the exact thing that is needed to get around the, right. the gentry wix. Yeah. Isn't this relaxed, uh, this authority model that you have, is, isn't somehow related to the uh, per function trusted setup that we already have in some snarks like ROS 16 or QAP stuff? Uh, I, I'm not sure. I guess I don't know the details of those well enough to, to say for sure, but those are per function, right? So. Right. Here we right. have an authority who um, will give you uh, as many opening keys as you want, and they all work with respect to the same public the same, the uh, parameters. Same. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, so that, yeah. that could be an issue. Okay, so th they're not exactly the same. Okay, great. Okay, yep. Okay. Great. Okay, so we'll dive into a little bit uh, the technicals, and I just want to define the assumption that we use throughout the work. Um, it's called short integer solution or SIS. And it has a few parameters. These parameters aren't too important, but I, I wanna write them down for, for completeness. So it has uh, two dimensions, N and M, and then a modulus uh, Q. And the problem can be stated quite simply as uh, I give you a uniformly random matrix A and everything in blue, so the color coding is, is important here. Everything in blue is uniformly random. This is a uniformly random uh, matrix A. It's N rows by M columns, and the entries are uh, uniformly random mod Q. The goal is to find a uh, non-zero short vector in the kernel of A. So uh, also the color coding here, everything in red will mean short. Okay, so short is a, a qualitative notion, but think of uh, short as like the Euclidean norm of X being much less than Q. Okay, so think of maybe binary entries or entries between, you know, plus minus ten, something like that. Um, so you're looking for an entry in the kernel of A with small, uh, sorry, a vector in the kernel of A with uh, small entries, um, and and this A x equals zero mod Q. Okay, so this is a a very standard and well studied uh, lattice assumption by this point. And the reason it's uh, so nice to work with, um, apart from its syntactic simplicity, is uh, that it also has this great worst case uh, to average case reduction, which was originally given by Itai uh, in 96, and many follow-up works have improved this. But the nature of what this reduction says is that if you can solve SIS, that is, if you can find a uh, non-zero vector, a uh, short vector x, whose norm is, is much smaller than Q, then uh, for a uniformly random matrix A, <clears throat> then you can convert that solver into an algorithm that solves uh, short vector problems on any n-dimensional lattice, that is in the worst case. So up here, we're talking about a cryptographic problem where A is chosen uniformly at random, but breaking this problem implies being able to solve 
uh, hard lattice problems on any uh, lattice of dimension n. And there's no randomness down here. This is a worst case uh, type problem. So this gives us a, a good, uh, you know, good evidence and good feeling that indeed this is a hard uh, average case problem uh, SIS is. And yeah. uh, that's, that's also backed up by you know, cryptanalysis and, and study. Yeah. Chris, uh, just a question about this second, the sort of vector problem. What do we, do we know about the complexity of this, like the complexity class of the short vector in N? Yeah. Right, so these, these short vector problems, uh, they're unlikely to be NP hard. Um, they mm. are in NP intersect co-NP mm. uh, because of the uh, approximation factors they carry. Um, okay. But they're, you know, they're, they're very well studied problems, um, you know, polynomial approximation factors, uh, mm -hmm. whereas, you know, the best uh, polynomial time attacks we have only get exponential or slightly sub exponential factors. So we're, we're very far, you know, the best algorithms we have for these problems are uh, essentially um, exponential time in the dimension of the lattice. Mm -hmm. Good. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Sure. So this is the problem that we'll be using. And, and again, the problem is just given a random matrix A, find a short vector in its kernel, short non-zero vector in its kernel. So now we can describe uh, the, the vector commitment scheme. And uh, first I'll start with the setup. So this is what the uh, authority does to generate the public parameters. And uh, really this is where all the magic happens. The rest of the scheme is really quite uh, easy and simple once you You've got this set up here. <clears throat> so it works as follows. Um, so D again is our dimension of the data. And we're going to say for every I from, from one to D. So that's what this bracket D notation means. It means one through D. We're going to sample uh, a random matrix A together with uh, what's known as a trap door. And I won't uh, describe how that works, but um, this is kind of a, a commodity type algorithm now. Um, Given, given works of the prior uh, 15 years or so. So we can generate this with a trapdoor. It's not kind of analogous to like choosing an RSA modulus together with its factorization. Okay, so we, we do that. Um, we sample all these matrices AI with their trapdoors. And then uh, also for J one through D, we're gonna sample a uniformly random vector uh, U sub J. And then uh, the interesting part happens. We're going to say for all distinct i and j, so all, all i not equal to j, we're going to use the trapdoor, our trapdoor for a sub i, to do what's called pre image sampling. We're going to pre image sample a short vector rij so that ai times rij equals uj. Okay, so we have these kind of roughly d squared short uh, vectors uh, rij, and that's where the, the quadratic d squared size of the uh, public parameters comes from. Okay, so we, we use the trapdoor to sample these, uh, sample these pre-images or these, uh, these vectors rij. Note that they're short, so they're in red. And then we're gonna output all these quantities as the public parameters. So if you don't like uh, so many equations, here's a nice pictorial way to view what we've done. Uh, it's a kind of a big system of, of uh, equations or a big matrix system here. So if you imagine on the left, we've put these A sub I matrices down the diagonal. And then on the right, we put uh, U1, fill up the first column with all these copies of U1, second column with copies of U2, and Dth column with copies of UD, except that we punch a hole in the diagonal. So we put zeros down the diagonal. Okay. And then <clears throat> we, uh, we have this matrix big R, which just has all these, uh, uh, basically D times D minus one vectors uh, R, I, J in them. Okay, so R21, or R12, R22, I'm sorry, R12, R13, up to R1D and so forth uh, throughout filling in the, the upper and lower triangle of this matrix, again, with zeros uh, down the diagonal. So if you, you can kind of see that this works out. If you take this top row times the first column, you end up with zero because the A1 matches up with the zero and these zeros all match up with the Rs. So you end up with a zero in the diagonal. But if you take this first row times the second column, you end up with A1 times R12 and then a bunch of zeros. So A1 times R12 equals U2 and so forth. 
If you look at the second row times the first column, you get this A2 times R21, everything else vanishes. So A2 times R21 equals U1 uh, and so forth. Okay, so this is sort of the picture of uh, how the um, public parameters are, are set up. And you'll maybe see my dog in the background. Okay, so that's the setup. And now let's talk about how the uh, commitment works. So we have these public parameters and we want to commit to a message. Let's say that the message is uh, just binary. So a D-dimensional binary vector is not really necessary, but it's the simplest way to describe things. So all we do here is we take uh, the message and we use these zero ones uh, to kind of do a subset sum over these uh, uj vectors. So we see just sum up uj mj. And if you view the u vectors as columns of a big matrix u, then it's just uh, u times m. Okay, and that's our, that's our commitment. So very simple, just, uh, just a matrix times of the data vector. When we want to open, um, we do something kind of interesting. So we want to open the ith entry of uh, our data. We're going to output a proof pi, which will just be like the ith row of our big uh, R matrix. So that ith row or ith block of rows, really, um, times our matrix, uh, times our vector m. So if you remember, the ith row looks something like this, right? It's got all these R, I, J vectors in them, but punctured uh, on the diagonal. And we hit that with M. And so altogether, this is just the sum over R, I, J times M, J over all J not equal to I, right? The, the not equal comes from the fact that this, this zero is here that kind of um, vanishes or, or um, knocks out M sub I. Okay, so that's how we open and observe that because this R matrix is, is made of short vectors and M is a short vector, then altogether uh, this combination is also relatively short. So the proof is a short uh, vector. So let's see how to verify. Basically verification uh, just sort of plugs in the missing um, RIJ, uh, sorry, the missing RII times MI piece, but it does so, um, in the in the in the range rather rather than the domain, so the rule is we accept proof pi if it's a sufficiently short vector, and if ai times pi plus ui times mi equals c. All right, so whether if this equals the original commitment to the data, so let's see why this works. Um, let's just write out. Let's expand out this left hand side. Okay, this left hand side ai times pi is just ai times rim, right, by definition up here. And then we add ui mi. And now um, expanding out the definition of rim, it's this summation, right? So now, and we can bring the ai inside the summation. So we have sum over j not equal to i of ai rij mj, and then this additional additive term. And then uh, we just note that by definition, AI RIJ equals UJ, okay? So altogether, uh, we have the sum over all J not equal to I of UJ MJ, and then we have the missing piece UI MI, and by definition, that is the, the commitment, okay? So this is just why proofs work, right? This is, this is why when you uh, open a commitment properly, uh, the proof actually verifies. Okay, any, any question about, about this? It's just kind of a lot of wrangling equations. It's kind of a, there's some similarities here to Catalano theory in some sense. Uh, For sure, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah lot, lots of them. I mean, analogously, it's sort of a, sort of a hybrid between the RSA construction and the pairing construction. It has elements of, of each of them, um, but, but is not a direct analogy of, of either one individually. Yeah. That's kind of neat. Yeah. Way. That's cool. I, I think uh, when you do a tree based construction with this, it, it might be interesting to think of aggregation if it has parallel to Catalan theory. We've had some thoughts there. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we can do some, um, there are some easy, there are some easy things to aggregate and there are some hard things to aggregate uh, in this construction. But the easy things are not the interesting ones, I think. Uh, the, yeah, I can say more about that at the end. 
So let me just describe uh, the updates real quickly. So this scheme is statelessly updatable. And the key behind that is the fact that um, the commitment function is really just this linear function. It's you take, take the public parameter u and multiply it by your message. That's linear. And again, the, and the, also the opening uh, function is linear. So you just take the ith block of, of uh, rows from the public matrix R and hit it with your message M. And so the updates are really easy. If you want to change entry J by Delta, you just kind of add UJ times Delta to your commitment and it, it works by linearity. Um, same thing with the proof. So why this is correct, simple exercise for the viewer, but the, you know, the hint is what I've just said. It's are linear. In fact, if you do a commitment and then an update, you get exactly the same output as if you had done a commitment on the modified message uh, to begin with. This is pretty simple. Okay, so I'll just say a few words about the security. I think there's a kind of a neat uh, security argument here. So we have a theorem which says that uh, breaking the position binding of this construction is at least as hard as solving uh, SIS. So let's kind of get a flavor of, of why that's true. <clears throat> so suppose that we have some adversary that uh, you know tries to break or can break position binding. With what this means is it outputs some uh, commitment C star maliciously constructed. Maybe it's it's up to the adversary to produce it. Um, some index i, uh, some two different entries m i and m i prime, and valid proofs for both of them. Okay. So if you just write down the verification equation, it says this. It says that um, since both of these proofs verify, C star is AIPI plus UIMI, that's the, the verification condition. And also it's AIPI prime plus UIMI prime. So if you kind of just gather these things together, what it tells you is that this matrix AI with an extra UI column tacked on uh, times uh, this vector, which is the difference of the proofs and then the difference of the message entries tacked on to the, to the last entry uh, equals zero. Okay. So does this solve SIS? It seems like it does, right? We've got this uh, uniformly random matrix here. Okay, it's kind of broken up into two pieces but the whole thing is uniformly random. Um, this vector here is non-zero because MI is different from MI prime. So this entry is non-zero. So the whole vector is, is not zero and uh, it's short, right? We have red minus red, red minus red, everything is relatively short. So it seems like this might solve SIS. Are we done? Somebody say no, uh, no, we're not done. And in fact, this argument is, is, doesn't really get us there. And the problem is that we had to have generated the public parameters. And when we generated the public parameters, we had to use a trap door for every one of these AI matrices, right? We created AI with a trap door, but SIS is not a hard problem if you know a trap door for, for AI, okay? So in other words, this would have solved SIS. This argument does, does uh, you know, actually create a, you know, is a valid uh, solution to SIS if this AI UI matrix were given to us as a challenge externally as an SIS instance, um, and the rest of the public parameters were still generated properly. Okay, so the challenge we have here is to be given uh, AI and UI as a challenge instance, and then generate all the public parameters around it, and then invoke our uh, adversary who breaks position binding. Okay, and if we can make that work, then, then we'll have a real uh, proper security proof here. So, so Chris, is, is, is the problem the fact that along with the AIs, you also revealed these RIs that, and the UJs that were, were computed with a trapdoor? Yeah, you could see that as, as a, a, a reflection or, or a different view on, on the issue. Mm -hmm. um, you need to be able to generate all these public parameters, all these RIs, which are, you know, have these interesting okay. um, relationships among them. Um, and, and still and do that without knowing a trapdoor for, for AI, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so that's, okay. that's the issue. Got it, okay, thanks. So how am I on time? Sorry, I was muted. Um, you have another 10 minutes. Okay, great, all right. Time for questions. 
So I'll, I'll go over the, um, the, the, the kind of proof argument or have the, the structure of the argument and then uh, wrap up with a few, few final thoughts. Okay, so our goal is again, to be given this AI UI as a challenge and then generate the public parameters so that they look good and uh, then invoke the adversary and uh, hopefully the adversary gives us you know, this information, which then we use to legitimately solve SIS. Okay, so here's, here's how it works. Let's suppose that the reduction you know, is given uh, a real SIS instance, so a uniformly random A star U star, and our goal is to generate good looking parameters. So I'll remind you of the structure of the public parameters. Um, down here on the, on the left, we have this block diagonal matrix, which is supposed to have A1, A2 through AD. On the right, we're supposed to have U1 through the entire first column, except for the, the zero, and then U2 through the second column and UD throughout the, the last column, again, except for the, the diagonal. <clears throat> and then here on the off diagonal entries, we want to have these short uh, RIJs. Okay, so here's how we're going to do it. We'll, we'll kind of fill in uh, this diagram piece by piece. So the first thing we do is we're gonna guess uh, uh, the value I star. And we're just gonna plug in uh, a, a sub I star as A star. Okay, so this is a guess about where we think the adversary will break position binding. So we just choose it randomly and guess it and plug in uh, the external A star there and also plug in U star at the, the same kind of position. So here it's two, right? I star is two. So we plug these in and we've, we're, we're on our way. Um, second thing we'll do is for all J's not equal to I star, we're gonna sample a short uh, R's. So R I star J's. So that kind of fills in this uh, second row here. And then once we fill in the second row, you can look at what effect does that have? Well, it basically defines uh, U1, U3, U4 up to UD. Right? So it defines all the UJ is not equal for J not equal to I star. Right? So if you just take this uh, column here times this row, you end up with uh, U1 defined as U1. You take this last column times this row, you end up uh, defining U sub D. And remember every column has at least just copies of the same UI, uh, UJ in it. So you've got to fill in all these uh, things here. So we filled in the entire right-hand side we filled in uh, one entry here and one row here. And now we do the rest. Uh, we do the rest in essentially the same way as the legitimate setup. So we're gonna generate the remaining A sub I's with knowledge of trapdoors, just as in the, the real setup. So A1, A3, up to AD, we generate these with trapdoors. And now uh, the rest of it is just filling in the blanks in this R matrix. Okay, so the right-hand side is fully specified. Um, and so, for example, if you want to fill in this bottom, uh, bottom left entry, well, you know that A sub D times this bottom entry should equal U sub one, right? So A sub D times R sub D comma one should equal U sub one. And you do that for all of the remaining uh, RIJs, right? So there's, there's all the first row, the third row, the fourth row, and so forth we can just fill in um, exactly as we did in the um, real setup, okay? So now we've filled in the entire system and uh, the theorem that you can prove is that these public parameters, you know, all together jointly um, are statistically close to what you get in the real setup. Okay, so this is using the, the pre-image sampling uh, technology and theorems, but uh, basically it says, the entire uh, set of public parameters jointly look as if they were created in the, in the real setup. And in particular, the value of I star that we guessed uh, is hidden. So we have about a one over D chance that when the adversary breaks position binding, it's actually doing so at position I star. And by the you know, equations we looked at uh, on the previous slide, this tells us as S an SIS solution for our challenge uh, instance here. Okay, so that's a high level view, kind of skipping over a lot of uh, grungy technical details, but that's the, the general picture. Any, any questions about this? Uh, 
I don't have any questions on the chat. Okay, cool. So given, given the time, I think what I'll do is just briefly talk about uh, the ideas uh, behind kind of extending this to trees and then wrap up with, uh, with a couple open questions. So, you know, we all know and love Merkle trees. This is the, the picture with Arity 2, branching factor 2. And you, use a, you can use an arbitrary collision resistant hash function uh, to get um, a nice commi uh, vector commitment from this. So Merkle trees can implement vector commitments for dimension d, uh, little d to the h. Right? And usually we set little d to be 2. Um, and so this gives us you know, constant size public parameters and commitments independent of the dimension. <clears throat> but they're not statelessly updatable. And the proof size is something like h times uh, d minus one. So you have to give all the siblings when you're when you're opening up an entry. There's a path from the leaf to the root, and you have to give all the siblings of every point uh, in the path. So there are d minus one siblings at every level. There are h levels, and so that's how many um, you know pieces of data you have to provide to in in the proof. And this is more than uh, log d. So one like kind of very natural idea, you know, if you know about Merkle trees, you know about vector commitments, well, let's just, instead of a hash function, use a vector commitment. Uh, and we use a vector commitment at each level uh, or at each internal node to vector commit to all of our children. So this has gone by the name of uh, Merkle trees because it's like vector plus Merkle, basically. Um, <clears throat> so that's a generic tree transform. And it allows you to, to do this. Um, using uh, you know, any tree of height h and arity d. And you just need a vector commitment scheme for arity d, little d, that is. So this gives you identical parameters, identical commitments to the original uh, base vector commitment. Uh, but the proofs don't need sibling info, right? The, the whole point of a vector commitment is there's a concise proof of uh, any entry, uh, you know, any child, basically, that, that you have. Uh, you don't have to give the sibling information to prove it. So you will now only need H proofs and commitments instead of H times uh, D minus one uh, to prove uh, an entry at the leaf. So in particular, you can use a larger branching factor D and that uh, say actually reduces H further. So you can use kind of a shallower tree with a larger branching factor and still uh, have even smaller proofs now. But this does not preserve uh, stateless updatability. So what we give in the paper is a, a more specialized uh, transform, which is in the spirit of this idea. Um, and it may, the key point is that it maintains the linearity of the commitment and the opening. So when you do this generic uh, scheme, you, know, you have to take the entries, all the children, put them into a vector commitment, take all those uh, parents, put them into another vector commitment, take all those grandparents, put them into a vector commitment and so forth. And that breaks the linearity uh, in general from one layer to the next. Um, so what we do is show how to, to not break that linearity. Um, and so the overall commitment procedure is still linear in the, the leaf data and also the opening of the proofs are, are linear. And so this allows you to do uh, stateless updates um, and still have similar efficiency properties as the, the vertical tree. Okay, so this is again the same uh, table that I that I flashed up before, but the savings it gives you is uh, like a factor of D, little d in the, the proof size. Okay, so I won't uh, go into the functional commitments other than to put up this picture. This is showing the uh, authority um, model, right, which is that when you want to open, you can't just directly provide the function that you want to open, but instead you provide the function to the authority who then extracts an opening key. And this opening key is what you provide to the, the open algorithm and, and everything else is the same. Okay, so that's the model. Um, I'll skip over how we uh, construct these things, but it's a, it's a kind of a different uh, twist on usage of uh, fully homomorphic uh, commitments and, and fully homomorphic encryption. So skipping over that, uh, leave with us some open problems. So probably the, you know, the most notable thing about our vector commitment is that our constructions are requiring a private coin setup, right? The authority has to run uh, a procedure with private coins and generates trapdoors. 
and that data has to be destroyed or or distributed, you know, with an MPC. Um, so, are there post quantum vector commitments or functional commitments that have public setup uh, with the same or better features and efficiency? I think that's a nice question. Um, and then the question that we've already asked about or already mentioned is the functional commitment has this online authority to generate opening keys. And can you get you know, functional commitments for non-linearizable functions with just an offline authority who sets things up and disappears, right? And you know, as, as Rosario mentioned, there might be some inherent bound, uh, barriers here, right? Like maybe functional commitments imply snarks for you know, so suitable rich classes. And so maybe there's a good reason why we have to have this online uh, authority, um, or some inherent reason why you can't go offline with it. And then third, um, for vector commitments, I, you know, we have post quantum vector commitments now, but we, and we have some not very interesting ways of combining them, but we don't have things like sub vector commitments where you can open several entries at once at kind of the size or cost of, of a single proof. Uh, we don't have aggregatable post quantum vector commitments. Uh, there's lots of other nice properties that people have shown for vector commitments um, in the pairing based world, for example. Um, and so it'd be really interesting to see those kinds of things for uh, post quantum uh, vector commitments as well. Okay, that's all I have. Thanks for letting me go over a, a couple minutes. Thank you, Chris. Uh, there may be one question. Hold on, I'm monitoring the chat. Oh, so where does the H to the three factor in the openings come from? Oh yeah, so that's that's a, a great question. Um, the the proof size was like H cubed D uh, log D squared, right, or log squared D. Um, mm -hmm. it, it has to do with the growth of the. Um, uh, kind of the randomness or the, well, the growth of the coins or the growth of the message as you, um, you know, the, the, the proof is some big linear, is some linear function of the message and it kind of expands the message to a larger, uh, larger norm, right? So this message vector kind of gets blown up and um, basically each stage of the, the tree kind of incurs a multiplicative factor in, in how much H gets blown up. So we were wanting to be really honest about this and counting actual bit sizes, right? So, you know, to write down the integers that are in these vectors in the proof, um, you know, the number of bits that you have to write down is, 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 is growing. And then in order to, um, because those grow, the value of Q has to grow. And so you kind of get some, some nasty uh, dependencies there. Um, so it, it, it comes down to like, the bit sizes of the numbers that are involved uh, throughout the system. And maybe this is related. What's the dependence in the security parameter? Linear? Right. Linear. Well, let's see. Um, what you have to do is, is take the sizes of the proofs, uh, their, their norms, basically, right? Their Euclidean norms, and then set parameters so that the SIS problem is, uh, is hard for those uh, for those norms. So I don't think, you know, concretely the asymptotics are not terrible, but they're they're not particularly attractive uh, there as well. Um, so you need to use relatively large uh, SIS parameters uh, for some of these more fancy uh, features. Okay. 